Good morning, it's somewhere, and welcome back to the Constellation 2020 Green Room. Hide your can beats, because joining us now is game master of his own destiny, Robert Schwab. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, absolute pleasure, Robert. So what's the story with the beats? Because I'm sure that's what everyone wants to know. Uh, I, you know, it's one of those weird joke things, like canned beets are just kind of gross to, to me uh, as, a, as a food item. And so uh, I, I, will, uh, I will often joke about things like, uh, these are beets for eating and these are beets for throwing. And then uh, you just throw the canned beets, the passing trains, try to hit the hobo, stuff like that. It's a little bit of, it's a little bit of my madness, but I share. Yeah, we, we, we very much appreciate the whole, we're putting this here to see if you're really reading kind of thing. Right. <laughs> and, and we're going through our research and Danny says to me, so, I can't find anything on the internet about beat slinging. I was like, beat slinging? She was like, read this paragraph. I was like, oh, she said, that's not the only place it's marked down on the internet. So, well, fourth time champion, I understand. That's right, yeah. Uh, there was a, you know, the great beat slinging contest of 1981. It was a, it was a good year and I had trained. Uh, I went to Russia and lifted some logs uh, with, with uh, Sly Stallone in anticipation for his fight in uh, Rocky IV, although that was 1981, but you get the idea. Yeah, so, so not four consecutive years then if 81 was the first one. Right. Well, they're, they're, and they're, like, they're not all like 20, 20 years either where they're just interminable. So if we can get to less important topics, um, tell me a little bit about how you got into role play. Uh, role playing for me was uh, something that I always wanted to do uh, as far as the, the hobby was concerned when I was a kid, um, but it didn't have really much of an opportunity uh, until I was maybe when I was in sixth grade, uh, my neighbor who lived uh, behind me uh, offered a copy of Tracy and Laura Hickman's Rahaja, the adventure module for BECMI um, and for a quarter. And I naturally bought it. Uh, and I thought this is my doorway to real tabletop role-playing games. Uh, what ended up happening was that I didn't have the rule books, so I just extrapolated uh, my own set of rules from the game that I had uh, <laughs> or the adventure. And so we played uh, my first role-playing game, Passages in the Schoolyard with all the other fellow kids. Uh, it wasn't until sometime not too long after, although it seemed like a million years then, that I uh, managed to acquire the red box and that led me down into the descent that is tabletop role-playing games, a hobby and a profession. Yeah, and you, you went from, I don't know the rules, I guess I have to make it up to being in charge of helping make up the next version of the rules. Yeah, there was, who, who knew that would happen? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's fascinating the things that we, we get to do, the, the situations we fall into. What, what got you actually into the professional side of things? I had uh, dropped out of college uh, and did uh, the McDonald's management thing for a number of years, got married. Um, my wife went back for her master's and I decided that I was going to get my undergraduate, my, my bachelor's. So I went to school, did that for a couple of years and then graduated. Um, and right around the time when third edition was really kind of exploding, uh, 3.5 hadn't come out yet, but uh, third edition was was booming and it seemed like there were publishers just popping up every day and there was uh, impressive release uh, release schedules we saw stuff from i mean countless adventures supplements source books all the other stuff that was going on it seemed like but the big opportunity for seemed to come at that very moment because everyone was having open calls and asking looking for submissions so I uh, sent in a, a couple of pitches to Mongoose Publishing. They bought uh, the first two or three books from me. That led to work with Green Ronin Publishing, uh, where I helped out on the first book of Fiends and wrote the Unholy Warriors Handbook, Asimar and Tiefling, Cavaliers Handbook, um, and a variety of other things. That led to also work for Fantasy Flight Games on Grimm, um, AEG is the world lar world's largest dungeon. Paradigm Concepts, I worked for uh, a couple projects on, for them, including Witch Hunter, The Invisible World. Uh, eventually, Gr uh, Green Renine hired me to be, it wasn't really that long, uh, they hired me on as the D20 line developer. 
And I worked in that uh, role for maybe six months to a year before I took over the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay line and managed that through uh, with uh, Black Industries um, for a, the life of the game from, I guess, Realms of Sorcery on. And while that was all happening, uh, I managed to land my first freelance job with uh, Wizards of the Coast. And I think the first book I can, that has my contributions in it is probably Tome of Magic uh, for a thir- uh, 3.5. And that led to a series of regular steady gigs until um, I guess the fourth edition came out and Wizards of the Coast hired me on as a contract designer. And so I worked with them for a number of years and that led me to finally uh, my work on fifth edition. And then, uh, which has apparently become just everyone's favorite game, which is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> and so following that, uh, that led, then I left Wizards of the Coast and uh, started my own imprint, and here I am. So there's a long, long story there, but exciting one. So you mentioned D20, and I, I find that fascinating because, amongst other things, I'm also a software developer, and to my mind, D20 is kind of the open source option in the role play world. Right. What are your feelings about it? I know you just said that you were responsible for a piece of, of how it was being used in one company, but, but ultimately, as somebody who gets paid to do design work, how do you feel about the free version that's out there? Um, so we've had, like, we're now up to the third, uh, third incarnation of uh, the, the, the system reference document. The, I know GSL for fourth uh, edition was a little, was far more restrictive and the SRD was a lot smaller. Uh, but uh, I think it's interesting. Um, I think on the one hand, it gives you an easy entry point for a lot of, again, budding game designers. Uh, we can see on DM's Guild, that is uh, a hotbed of, 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 and a great, it's a hotbed of talent. And we're seeing a lot of interesting products out there that are coming out uh, for the d and uh, And they're using, they're, they have the same look and feel and taste and flavor. And it seems it's a good opportunity for Wizards of the Coast to kind of cultivate uh, and build up their talent pool. I think originally uh, when the third edition game hit the market and we had the OGL, I think that was also a period of excitement, great excitement, because it allowed people the first for the first time really ever to start tinkering with the game that we've all grown up and played and loved. But I also think that it created a whole lot of noise. Uh, there, there, there's so, there was so much and everything seemed to have to uh, seem like it was going the route of there's the one game system to rule them all. Everything had to be uh, powered by the player's handbook. Everything had to be D20 system based. And we saw all sorts of things that were turned into D20 or using the D20 system that probably never should have. Um, and I feel to some, I feel like uh, I'm struck with deja vu. I mean, it's only, it seemed like it was just yesterday that we were dealing with third edition rules but here we are now grappling with uh, the same kind of problems where we're starting to see a whole bunch of companies, a whole bunch of companies using powered by fifth edition. And so it's creating some more noise than I'm comfortable with. But the good side of that is, is that once that, once that bubble bursts, uh, it, it creates an opportunity for a whole lot of new and interesting games to come out in, in the quiet that follows. As a, as a fiction writer, I'm very familiar with the signal to noise problem. If you look at Amazon, you look at Barnes & Noble, you look at any of the sites out there, there's so much garbage. And right. it makes it very hard to find the people who are actually good. It does actually really interfere. And that bubble doesn't seem to be bursting. So I, I hope to write about it in the role play side of it, that it's a, a bubble that will have its burst and we'll get to see those talents. I think so. Um, there's always a kind of question about whether or not we should have uh, this is a bad word, but gatekeepers uh, for finished product to hit the audience. I mean, it's, and I, 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 I'm in two minds, right? I think open it all up, let everybody play and the best will rise to the top. Um, however, I also do think that there are, sometimes it's good to have professionals uh, who are good at recognizing the talent to usher in people who are capable and worthy and not even worthy, but capable in, in, in a way that 
we don't have to fight for a, for a space in a place that is, you know, uh, filled with substandard uh, offerings. But we'll see. So when you're playing, and I assume you still play, when you're playing, what kind of characters attract you? What makes a character interesting to you? Well, for uh, if the uh, I'm more of hmm, I started off. I've kind of evolved, right? I, I like to hit things. Uh, I like to hit things. <laughs> uh, I I I'm at, I've been doing the the game design thing long enough now that um, I'm more. Uh, this sounds terrible, but if I'm going to write anything, <laughs> I I need to have I need to get paid for it. So yeah. when I'm playing a role playing game or running a role playing game, I'm more actually when I'm playing a role playing game, I'm more of the guy who just wants to beat things until they stop moving. That's kind of a stress reliever thing. But uh, as a, and that, that is still true. Um, but I tend to be more of, uh, I'm going more in the, the magic user direction these days. I think uh, I, I enjoy casting spells and solving problems and being creative with those spells and just kind of exercising my brain in different ways than just beating things with sticks. So that wasn't really a good answer to your question. Um, I don't play very often, sadly. Um, the quarantine has been interesting in that it created opportunities for me to indulge myself in all the role playing I could ever want, right? I mean, all I have to do is just say on Facebook or Twitter, hey, I want to get a gaming group together. And I'm sure I wouldn't have a problem finding people to play with. The trouble is, is that uh, my headspace is not not a, not a happy place to be, and so I find it difficult for me to want to sit in my office any more than I have to, if that makes sense, and and sit in front of a camera and role play and do all that stuff because it's just an extension of my job. So when I do play and do run games, it tends to be more about play testing uh, and reflecting what I'm actually doing uh, with work. Now, the exception to this is that for a while we were playing Mass of Nyarlathotep uh, for Call of Cthulhu, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and we've been exploring uh, more with Call of Cthulhu because largely that's a, that's a game engine that I'm probably am not gonna work on anytime soon. And it is pretty far outside of what I do these days on a day-to-day -day basis. So it is actually a welcome escape. Well, it, it, it's not so much how do the heroes win, it, it's who goes crazy last when you're playing Call right. of Cthulhu. Yes. Which, you know, it really should be the game of this year. <laughs> yeah. 2020 has had a few odd twists and turns. It sure has. Uh, Ups and downs. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I guess there is a, a certain amount of, of Zoom burnout that we're all going through. And I, I certainly have friends that are, are ready to never sit in front of a camera again for the rest of their lives. Yeah. But um, it, it has as you've said, created certain opportunities. You know, my mom uses the phrase, it's better to be behind the accident than in the accident. So right. for those who aren't actually sick, who aren't actually directly affected by it, it's had some very bizarre and weird upsides. It, it's produced time for things to happen. Um, for the reasons we're doing the show now is because I have the time to do it. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned role playing, you specifically specified tabletop role play. Are there other tabletop games you play? Uh, I've been uh, using Tabletop Simulator to uh, great, uh, with great success lately. Um, I've been playing the hell out of Zombicide. And I know that's not a, it's, it's not high art, but I enjoy the hell out of it because it, every, every map is a puzzle and you've got different chess pieces you're moving around and you're playing against the game. You're not, it's not a competitive thing. There's no uh, in player elimination such that it exists. Uh, when you're playing with several characters, it doesn't feed, it takes a sting out uh, of having succumbed to uh, the, the runners or the other variety of nasty monsters that spawn. Um, we did that, we played Wingspan quite a bit. Um, let's see, what else do we do? Eldritch Horror is a game that we've tried, we've played twice. Uh, we played Small World uh, on uh, Tabletop Simulator. Before that, we were playing a lot of Gloomhaven and uh, the board game Hate, which is a beautiful game. It's that one I don't know. What's Hate like? Uh, it is. You, it's. Uh, it's really like a box version of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, except that it's more squad based. So you have 
uh, tribal warriors that are just uh, that that are these beautiful sculpts. Uh, they uh, and then you throw them at the your opponent, and typically it's um, you can play two games at a time with two with player against player, player against player. There are some uh, scenarios where you do uh, two on two or all four and it, everyone for themselves, but it is an ultra violent game. Um, you kick down uh, huts, murder all the inhabitants, burn them down, stuff like that. It's good stuff. Well, all that socially acceptable behavior. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. No, role play games can be a great release for that. It's a very safe place to experience those kind of things. Um, so I'm going to guess you're a little younger than I am because most people are. Uh, <laughs> What was your, your, your family and your friends' reaction when you started seriously getting into role play? Because I know it, it used to be kind of a very niche thing. It's very mainstream now, but back then, not all. Yeah, well, it, it's, still a, it's still a topic of therapy to some extent. Uh, when I was, it was hard. Uh, I would lived uh, where, I, where I was playing role playing games when I started. Uh, it was in the thick of the satanic panic. Um, my dad was the Jaffe mazes and monsters, all that good stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. We yeah. watched uh, mazes and monsters as a family on VHS. Uh, but my dad at first was extremely supportive. Uh, I think he found, I think actually he was supportive the whole time and he still is. Um, he found the, the toy soldier aspect, the miniatures and painting miniatures to be, a really interesting hobby and he got into that for a while um i tried running role-playing games for my parents after my parents divorced uh i continued to try my dad and i were always uh playing axis and allies or conquest of the empire or fortress america and a lot of those type games that's and, and avalon hill games so i had some background in those kinds of things prior to getting into tabletop role playing my mom, on the other hand, she uh, was adamantly opposed to it. Uh, my, she has um, some rather extreme religious views that uh, created some problems for me in the role-playing game field. Um, and she decided at one point that uh, it, it was a, a steady kind of drumbeat of, you've got to get stop playing d and I don't want you playing d and and that thing over and over again, until finally I just sold all the books. Um, uh, and so I got rid of all the books that I, that I had. Uh, and in return, I was, she didn't say anything about any of the other role playing games I was playing. So that allowed me to play <laughs> Marvel superheroes, Twilight 2000, Star Frontiers, uh, <laughs> Hidden Kingdom, Pendragon uh, once. Um, what else did I do? And, you know, we in Shadowrun and all the other games that came that were out. And then of course I found Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which is a far darker game than anything that was printed in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, at the time and so th there was no problem with that uh because it didn't say dungeons and dragons and so what was so silly about this was that the cost of me being a role-playing nerd was uh ostracism and bullying and all the other things and being called a satanist and all the other things that for my classmates uh and i certainly didn't do anything to help myself with it at that point i was a pudgy kid with glasses who was sad all the time because his parents split up um but uh, it was it was it was bad. Um, so when I when we eventually moved to a different town, uh, I found that the satanic panic the, had, had ebbed and gone away basically here, and people were starving for for role playing games. And so I found I reacquired all the D and D books, and then we played. Uh, and I made an incredible network of friends that has that have uh, been with me still. I mean, I still am friends with people from high school that I played D&D &D with back then. So, yeah, it was an interesting time. Yeah, I'm glad you said that thing about friends. I, I found that there, there's a lot, both with tabletop board games and with role play games that has brought me people that have stayed in my life for a very long time and have been very important in my life. Um, right. It, it, it's good to have a connection point that gets you decent people in your life like that. And I'm glad you've had that experience. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the, the difference between working for companies like Ronin, Wizards of the Coast versus running your own shop? Well, uh, 
running my own shop has a lot. There, there are advantages and disadvantages on both sides. Uh, running my own business has been fantastic. Shadow of the Demon Lord has been really good for me. Uh, my upcoming game, Shadow of the Weird Wizard, uh, it looks like it's going to be a big. I'm hoping it's going to be a big success. There's a lot of excitement about it. Playtest uh, feedback has been largely positive. Um, so those are good things. Um, Bad things are because I'm, you know, this there. This is not an industry in which dump trucks full of money come to your front yard and unload their cargo. Uh, so it's very difficult for for a company like my size to transition from one employee and a couple of contractors to three employees or five employees or even ten employees. And so it's largely been self-contained. So it's been a one-man operation, and it's because I just don't. I'm not going to put myself into debt or jeopardize my family uh, and our way of life by making it easier on myself by hiring other folks. Uh, so it is is always a tension. So if Weird Wizard ticks off and does gangbusters, then yeah, I can probably hire more people, and it, it, that's all good. Now the drawbacks. So the drawback is from that is that I have to wear all the hats. So I'm the social media guy. I'm the guy who wrangles editors, developer, uh, hire freelancers. I'm the art director. Uh, manage and wrangle artists, contracts, all that stuff that you have to deal with. It's and it leaves very little time for uh, being creative or even doing the work, right? Um, so you flip it over and you say, "Well, you need to go back to work for another company." Well, the other company means that there are people in charge, and people in charge may not have the same vision that you have for the products you want to make. And uh, there are situations where you might be working on a big box game, and it becomes you know, you might have a couple of people with a vision and then it becomes a couple more people with a vision and then it becomes designed by committee. And so then you, then you sacrifice because that's just how you have to work uh, your ideas on the altar of putting out a product. Um, I think the bigger the company, the more, the more, ch the more challenges you face on that end. Um, with the Ronins, it was, uh, I, you know, it was great that they're, they're family to me and they will always be, I haven't worked for them in years. I do freelance projects every now and then, but, um, the, I, you know, as I said, they they are family and it was a wonderful experience to work with them. Um, nothing negative to say, love them. It's a very good thing to be able to have those kind of experiences and to, to find like-minded people where you can do that kind of creation. Um, have you ever done anything collaboratively, not because you got put together as a corporate team, but because there are people by choice? Um, I've done very small things that way. Uh, I've experimented that with that in um, a couple of products for my company, but it's not, it's not a fair collaboration because I'm still the guy in charge. Um, so no, not yet. I haven't just dug in. I've got a couple of things cooking that there are opportunities for collaboration that we may see uh, see where that goes. You have a, a wish list, a couple of people that if they happen to be watching this, would, you'd love them to hear their name as one of those people? I would love to get the band back together uh, and do something with Bruce Cordell and Monty Cook. Early on in the fifth edition design process, we were the three guys in the room who were doing a lot of the design work on, on what would become fifth. And we work extremely well together. Uh, to the point where it was, I couldn't imagine. Uh, I mean, I couldn't imagine a better a better team, because we all have uh, different design sensibilities, but I think they complement each other in in interesting and powerful ways. And I'm I'm very friendly with them still, but it's mostly a time and schedule thing. I would also like to do a project with Ken Height, who I adore. Uh, I don't. We just haven't been able to make uh, the stars line up. There are others, and they knew who they are. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very exciting. So, so is how are you actually releasing your stuff now from your own company? Are you doing this with Kickstarter? Are you doing this through some other pre-order system, or do you have a different mechanism? Uh, largely, we do big releases uh, by way of Kickstarter to raise the funds to handle uh, production cost, art, and editing, and so on. Uh, typically, I, I I will only go to Kickstarter when the copy is, or the text is pretty much done because uh, I don't want to risk my reputation by being late. Um, so uh, that makes it hard. 
So like with uh, Weird Wizard, I have had to work on that in the background while working on other projects, which is why it's taken two or three years this game to get close to, to kickstart. Um, but uh, the benefit is that once we go through the Kickstarter process, there'll be a product within a year. Uh, we did. We had the same success with Punk Apocalyptic and the same success with Demon Lord. Uh, so I expect that will continue. Uh, that that model will continue for big games and then large releases for those games. So we did a Freeport set in conjunction with uh, the Ronins, and then we did a, a Kickstarter for Occult Philosophy, which is a big book of magic. Um, and so those were good. Uh, then after that is uh, pretty much I take a large chunk of my sales and reinvest them back into more products to do micro releases through the drive through RPG on my website. And what that lets me do is that it keeps uh, the various brands of, for my games stay front and center in people's minds as there's a regular release uh, cycle. So it feels that the game is always still being updated or expanded in some, even if they're minor ways. Uh, so it keeps it fresh in people's minds while also uh, keeping the level, the cost of, of staying current really low. I mean, if you bought, I mean, after five years, if you bought everything for Demon Lord, you'd spend a couple hundred bucks. But if you are subscribing like a month or like going to drive through and buying two products a month, you're at five, six dollars. And that's, and you're getting, and that's fun new content with some of the best artists and, and game designers out there. I'm glad you mentioned drive through RPG. I feel that they're an underappreciated resource. There's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, big fan. Yeah. And, and as to your wish list, by the way, Bruce and I talk occasionally on Facebook, so he might see this because of me, but the other guys I, I can't help you with. Uh, <laughs> so other than the, the current project that you've mentioned, is there anything else you want to pitch? Anything else you want people to watch out for? Uh, I think the key things are that Weird Wizard is ramping up. That's uh, where I put most of my focus. We're going to have some new releases for Demon Lord coming out over the next couple of months. Um, I'm working on a project for some Italian friends uh, called for the Nightfell setting. Uh, and I have a big, chewy adventure coming out for that sometime, I think, next year. Um, my friends in Spain are doing the Spanish version of Punk Apocalyptic. So if you're a Spanish speaker, Keep an eye out for that. And there'll be more releases for the punk apocalyptic role-playing game uh, in the next couple of months. So there, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff uh, working. My to-do list is growing by leaps and bounds. So there's always something <laughs> in the works. Very, very good. I appreciate the time and I'm glad you came out to play with us, sir. And uh, sure. I'm gonna try to get you and Flint and Luke back sometime next year and, and get the three of you guys on at the same time to chat a little bit. It sounds great. Yep, looking forward to it. Danny! Which brings us back to the end of the show, before the show that will never start.